How's everybody doing this morning? It's been a great morning. It's been a long week. Uh, starting out at the beginning of the week, we had four people in the hospital. Uh, one went home right away. We actually had five people in the hospital. Two went home right away. Uh, we have two in intensive care that are uh, on ventilators, and John Stewart will be probably coming home hopefully on Tuesday. I know he's watching right now from Good Samaritan over here, and so I have put on more PPE and cleaned my hands more this week than uh, I think I have in my whole entire life in a, in a short span. So, but everybody seems to be doing good, and everybody's improving. Lee's in, uh, Lee's in the hospital in Longmont, and uh, Gary is in the hospital right over here at Good Samaritan. And uh, yesterday I took him some music, and uh, Gary had just, they had just taken down his oxygen, and I brought in some MP3 players, put like three days of praise and worship music on it so they just didn't have to listen to the machines. And I was there, and the nurse said, there's no improvement. And the doctor walked out of the room and said, hey, we just dropped him from 70% to 65. He's really doing good. And I go in there, and I give him the music, and... Uh, he raises his hands and starts singing, and every single alarm on the whole thing went off because he was moving and he was trying to talk, and uh, he had tears just streaming down his face, and he just wanted to worship. <laughs> Took me about 10 minutes to get him calmed down. and uh, So they they're both are improving. They're, they both are very stable, though they're, they're on the upslide, both of them, and uh, so is John. So I'm excited that uh, they're moving in a, in a positive way. So I don't know how many of you uh, heard my message uh, on last Sunday, and part two was on Wednesday, and uh, I realized today, that's why I don't do a lot of notes sometimes, but I had notes, and then I went through, and I added to my notes, and then when I got here this morning, and I went to print it, I realized that I have about four weeks of sermons. But I'm going to do part one today, and I'm going to do part two on Wednesday, because we're doing the Bible College graduation next week. But this is a continuation of uh, just talking about what I talked about for last week. Last week, I was talking about the different storms we go through in life, and how they affect us, and uh, Today I'm going to be reading out of Matthew 15, and uh, the title of the message is The Power of Working Faith. And so, you know what, if we have faith and it's not working, then uh, it really isn't faith at all. And so, how many people here today have faith? Just raise your hand. You know what? Most of the people here have faith. Who doesn't have faith? See, nobody raises their hand. You know, when you, uh, when you look at uh, atheists, they complain all the time. There, there was all this stuff that just happened again over the Easter holiday and atheists were complaining that they don't have a holiday to observe. That's what I was going to say is April 1st. It's April Fool's Day. And the Bible says only the fool says in his heart there is no God. You know, and that's kind of a, a, a lighthearted approach. But you know what? Everybody has faith. I mean, we don't realize it, but each and every one of us have faith. Even an atheist has faith. Uh, sometimes we make it too mystical. Sometimes we make it too legalistic. Sometimes we say that it has to be like this and look like this, and this is the only outcome that can come from our faith. But uh, when you go into a restaurant, 
we have faith that we're going to get what we ordered. It doesn't always happen, but we still have faith that we're going to get what we ordered. You're not going to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and order a pizza and, and, and expect to get that. Have you ever noticed that when you go through the drive through and this just happened to me this week, it made me think about it, in the midst of my running around, I went through the drive through and you see the picture of this breakfast burrito, and when you get it, it looks nothing <laughs> like the picture. It was like one third the size, the fillings didn't look the same, they weren't all nice and layered, they were, it just wasn't the same thing. But you know what? We do have faith that they're going to make our food properly. We do have faith that they're going to follow the health standards. We do have faith that they're doing the right thing on the other side of the counter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. See, that, that, that's one way that we can all say that without even thinking about it, we're applying the faith that's in our life. I think that so many times we... Uh, We've been taught, and I've shared this many times, but it was revolutionary to me. When I first got saved, people would say, you know, that person there, they got so much faith. You know, when they were handing out faith, they got a train load, and I only got a thimble load. But the reality is, is when you read that scripture where it says to each one of us was given a measure of faith, it's saying that we were all given an equal measure. It's like God put in the faith measuring cup and everybody gets the same exact amount. That's what it's saying. And you know what? We all have the faith, but we don't write a check on that faith bank account. We think everybody else has more faith with us. Even in this last week, meeting with a couple of the wives of people that are in the hospital, they're like, I just don't have the faith you have that they're going to get better. I don't have the faith they're going to come home. But the reality is, they do have the faith, they're just choosing not to walk in that faith. And it's very easy to be put in that position when things are stacked up against you. You know, I don't know how aviation works, I don't know how aerodynamics work, but you know what? I'll get on an air airplane and I'll fly across the country, I'll fly across the ocean, I'll fly to the other hemisphere to see my daughter and son-in-law. I don't understand how this big, massive piece of metal gets up in the air with all the people and all the luggage on it and gets there, but I also don't think about it. You know what? That is a really active part of faith. It's, it's part of just stepping out and using our faith, and we don't even realize that that's how we're applying it. When you go see a surgeon, you have faith that they're going to take out the right part. You have faith that they're going to fix the right thing. You have faith that you know what they're doing. When you go get your prescriptions filled, you have faith that the pharmacist is going to give you what the doctor said. So, Jesus came along and he says, have faith in God. And you know what? Some people balk at that. Some people are like, oh, yeah, right. How, how can we have faith in God? Isn't that true? So faith in God, why is that so outrageous? Why do people put it so far out of the box? See, we have faith in all these other things around us. We have faith in little things. We have faith when we sit down on the chair today that we weren't going to end up on the floor. <laughs> Jennifer's laughing because she was with me in Thailand where you sit on a little plastic chair and I'm a big foreigner and you do end up on the floor sometimes. You got to have faith in proportion to the chair you're sitting on. But the question is, what is faith? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. In the Weiss translation of the Bible, uh, from the original Greek, it says, faith 
is the title deed of things hoped for and the proof of things which have not yet been seen. I want you to just think about that for a second. It's the title deed. <laughs> it's paid in full. Faith has already been given to us. So it's the title deed and it's the actual proof. The New Living Translation puts it this way. What is faith? It's a confident assurance that we hope for that what we hope for is going to happen. And it's the evidence of the things that we cannot yet see. See, the very existence of faith, despite our circumstances, is proof that there's a God. Just, just think about that for a second. The existence of our faith in spite, despite of our circumstances, just proves there's a God. See, we have the title deed he's given us. We have the faith he's given us. We have the measure of faith that he's poured out upon us. And all we have to do is choose in circumstances to just truly believe. And I think the problem today is the enemy keeps attacking our faith. He keeps attacking and he keeps telling us that things aren't going to happen. But I got to tell you, when you come in, I would virtually guarantee very few people worry about every chair they're sitting on. People just go in and they sit down on a chair no matter what. And you never think about, is this chair going to be okay? Unless you're extremely overweight, you're not going to worry about, is this chair going to hold me? You just automatically sit in a chair no matter what. See, it's that faith, that, NA, that, that faith that God put within us. Are we activating our faith in the same way in every day of our life? in every circumstance of our life. A lot of times we treat faith like it's something fragile, like a museum piece or like an egg. You know, we can only have faith in these little circumstances and we have to, we have to carry it just right. You know, we, we say, you know, here's my faith. Don't look at it. Don't breathe on it. Don't touch it. This is my faith. But faith isn't like an egg. Faith is like a muscle. It gets stronger the more we use it. The less we use it, the weaker our faith gets. And I'm not talking about just our everyday faith. I'm talking about stepping out of the ordinary. I'm talking about flexing that muscle of faith to where we're stepping out in faith and we're doing things. Muscles build up and then you break them down again when you use them. If you don't use, their mu if you don't use your muscles, then you get atrophy. Where all of a sudden your muscles, huh? And it's not fun. <laughs> and that's what faith is. It's something that we need to apply. It's something we need to use. It's something we need to do. It's, it's something that we need to have active in our life. And if we don't use that faith, then it really becomes useless. And then when we need it, we can't even move it. Faith is something that's always moving towards an object. Faith is a, is a, living, it's a living, restless thing. Faith all by itself can never be not operational. Because if it's not operational, it's not faith at all. We got to use our faith. We got to use our faith every day. We got to use our faith in every situation, the good ones and the bad ones. So why do we have to do this? Because it's by faith that we're saved. We're Christians. You know what? If you don't have faith that God's going to be there in all these circumstances, then how can you even be saved? How can you even walk in the fullness of what God has? How can you even walk into the minimal amount of what God has, let alone the fullness? 
See, we're told over in Ephesians 2.8, by grace you have been saved through faith. Not by ourselves, lest any man should boast. So what saves is faith alone. And the faith that saves is never alone. So you can't separate the two. And by that, what I mean is if you have real faith, there will be evidence of it in your life. The only way I can tell you that you have faith is not because you tell me you have faith, is because I see faith active in your life. I see faith evidenced in your life. I see faith actually being played out in your life. That's the only way you can really tell. You know what? I can't see your heart. But I can see your works. I can see your actions. I can see the things you do. And it's through faith. It's through this faith that we put our trust in Christ. It's easy to say one day that we're putting our faith in Christ. It's easy to say that we're putting our trust in Christ. But if we're not doing anything, if every circumstance that comes up, we're backing off, then we're really not using our faith. It's also this faith that we have to live in to be followers of Christ. You know why the church is so stagnant today is because people aren't walking in faith. People are just occupying space. People aren't stepping out and doing what God's called them to do. People aren't walking in faith. People are living in fear. People are being crippled by fear. Galatians 3.11 says, and the just shall live by faith. It doesn't say we're going to live by our feelings. It doesn't say we're going to live by what's good for us. It doesn't say that we're going to live by what we think. It doesn't say we're going to live by our circumstances. No, the just are going to live by faith. Faith can make the difference between something happening and something not happening. You know, one thing is going in and out of hospitals all this week, over and over and over for the last 10, 12 days. When you show up and you're walking by an ICU waiting room, you know what? There's not one atheist in that waiting room. No matter what they believed, the hours before their loved one came in, there's not one atheist. There's not one person, if you ask them, can I pray for you, that says no. It didn't matter what they were an hour ago or 24 hours ago. It didn't matter <laughs> who they were or what they stood on. When the chips are down, they want to pull on the faith. When the circumstances are out of control, they want to pull on the faith. It shouldn't be that way with us. <laughs> we should be walking in that faith all the time. It should be active. It should be being flexed. And the more that comes against us, the stronger that should make us. See, faith can make the difference between something happening and something not happening. See, it's God who does the work, but he chooses to do it through humans. He chooses to do it through men and women that he created. You know what? The Lord could have sovereignly caused the Red Sea to part the moment he arrived, the moment the children of Israel arrived, but he didn't. He chose Moses. And then he chose Moses to use a staff. See, there was an action. Moses had to A, hear from God, and B, he had to activate that faith. He had to do something with what he had.
See, God could have brought down fire on the altar at Mount Carmel without Elijah. But he called Elijah to both pray and then take a step of faith. See, Elijah had to pray and listen to see what God said. And when God said it, it didn't matter if it made sense. And you got to realize, is when you read that whole story, you know, I honestly, when I read the story, and it doesn't really tell us, but when I read the story, when Elijah heard from God, it was so loud, it was so clear, it was so much that it overwhelmed him that he said, go ahead and pour water on it. Because I want, you know, I already know what God said. God's going to come down and consume it, and we're going to make this a doozy. See, he prayed, and he heard God, and his faith was so high, he's like, nothing's going to stop this. <laughs> you could put it in the bottom of the ocean, and the water, the fire is still going to go down and consume Two thousand years ago, when Jesus walked the earth, he could have healed every person. He could have wiped out every disease, every sickness that was or ever would be. But he didn't. Jesus could have just stood in one place and just said, "Be healed." And people around the world, people that didn't even know who he was, could have been healed instantly. But what we find is, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, it's people who reach out to God that are healed. People that reach out to him by faith. The woman who touched the hem of his garment, blind Bartimaeus, they both called out to him. She called out in an action. He called out with his voice. And God met them both. And then we also look at that Jesus couldn't do those mighty works in his hometown of Nazareth. Why? Because their unbelief was so great. He was there to do the same thing, but they didn't have faith that it could really happen and especially happen through a Nazarite, through the carpenter's son. This is the one we saw. So faith can make the difference between something happening and something not happening. We also need to remember that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six 6 goes on to say, Without faith, faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. See, we got to put action to what we're doing. We, we got to do our part. The faith is there. I mean, the exact way I did explain it to somebody this week is you already have the whole bank account of faith, just write the check. And the great part is, your check's never going to bounce. And you're never going to overdraw the account because the account is literally unlimited. But we're so stingy with our faith, we want to write a check for $2 and not for $2 trillion. We could write that $2 trillion faith check and it would cash. No questions asked. Or we could write one for two cents and it would cash. The difference is the impact. The Bible has a lot to speak about the topic of faith. Throughout the Bible, some of the faith, there's weak faith, there's strong faith, there's bold faith, there's rich faith, there's abiding faith, there's steadfast faith, there's precious faith, there's common faith, there's working faith, there's obedient faith, and it even speaks of dead faith. 
And so today, before we leave, we're going to go in detail over each and every one of these and all of them. No. <laughs> Hope you pack breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you can call into work tomorrow. When you start to study faith, there's so many kinds of faith, but you know what? All of them are faith. We just want to make sure that we're using the faith God gave us. Even when it's weak or even when it's bold, it makes no difference. We need to be using the faith God gave us. So in the sermon last week, I was talking about a man of faith. Peter, by faith, gets out of the boat and walks out to Jesus. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, after he heard the call of God, he stepped out of the boat. But after he stepped out of the boat, he started to walk. And what did he do? He took his eyes off Jesus and he started looking at the circumstances that are around him. He started looking at the wind and the waves. He started looking at the turmoil of the sea. And what happened immediately? He immediately began to sink. And what did Jesus say to him? Jesus said, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? See, in the Greek, little faith is actually one word. It's not a two-word thing like we put in the English. Little faith. How would you like to have a name like that? So effectively, Jesus said, oh, little faith. It's almost like he was nicknaming Peter little faith. And I'm thinking, Peter's the only one that got out of the boat. But see, he got out of the boat at first, but he immediately took that bold faith and he turned it into little faith instantaneously. He's the only one that heard, all of them heard, he's the only one that actually heard in his heart and stepped out of the boat. And then after he stepped out of the boat, that's when things changed, is when he looked at what he had just done. So let's look at a contrast. <laughs> That's what today is about, the contrast. We're going to look at a woman with great faith. And what a contrast she was to Peter. Uh, this woman was not raised as a Jew knowing the scriptures like Peter did. And she sure, certainly didn't have the privilege of walking with Jesus, of being one of his disciples that followed him like Peter had. In fact, the woman that we're going to talk about was a straight-up pagan raised in a godless home. Her home was filled with horrible idols. But with the little bit that she knew about Jesus, she applied dramatic faith and walked it all the way through. We can even describe it as amazing faith. In Matthew 15, 28, Jesus said, O woman, great is your faith. <laughs> he told Peter, O ye of little faith, and he tells this pa pagan woman, O woman, great is your faith. You know what? Jesus was an expert on faith. We would look at the same situation and we would say, Peter had great faith. And who is this pagan? I would say larger than 50% of the Christian world would say it's impossible for her to have any faith. Because she hadn't done this and this and this and this and this. Jesus says, your faith, woman, is amazing to me, and it is a great faith. He wanted his disciples to pay attention. He 
She was called the woman of great faith. While yet a pagan. This was a lady who had a daughter who was in trouble. She was actually controlled by demons. The woman knew by either hearing or seeing, she knew by Jesus' reputation that if he would just touch her daughter, she'd be set free. So she fought all odds and she went right to Jesus. She pushed through the crowds. She got past the disciples. She went right for the jugular. She didn't stop anywhere. See, her faith couldn't be deterred. It couldn't be stopped. It couldn't be sidelined. It wasn't going to be slowed down. She was a mother, and she wasn't going to give up. The story is found in Matthew 15, starting at verse 21. I closed my Bible. So if you want to open up your Bibles to Matthew 15, we'll start in verse 21. And it said, And Jesus went away from there, and he withdrew to the district of Tyre of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before me, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, Is it not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? And she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you as you desire. And her daughter was instantly healed. See, when you, when you actually start to, to study this out, Jesus went out and he was on, uh, in the region of Galilee. He had just fed the 5,000. There was a stir. This at that time was one of the greatest miracles that anybody had ever seen. So his disciples are all on a high note. You know what? The master can do anything. Look what happened. The people are all in a stir. The disciples are in a stir. And then they crossed over and they departed from there. It says to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So in verse 23, you might even want to underline it in your Bible, but when she came and spoke to him, it clearly says he didn't even answer her a word. He didn't even respond to her request. And his disciples came and they urged him, they were saying, send her away. Isn't that what we do today? Send them away. They're not doing the right things. So let's look at who this woman was. In verse 22, it says she was a woman of Canaan. When you think about that, and you hear the word Canaan, we think about the land of Canaan. And we got to remember that the Israelites were delivered from Egypt and they crossed through the wilderness. They spent 40 years getting from point A to point B. And they went through that land.
You know how come they had to spend 40 years? Because men were leading them and nobody would stop and ask for directions at any of the gas stations. <laughs> that isn't why. They wandered because of their disobedience. They wandered because by faith they didn't go take the land that God had already told them. By faith, they didn't step out and just walk into what God had already said was theirs. When they finally made it to the brink of the promised land, the Canaan's land, why was it called that? It was called that because the Canaanites lived there. They were the enemies of Israel. So, right out of the gate, when you see this woman, this woman comes from the enemies of Israel, and Jesus is saying that he was called to the lost sheep of Israel. She was an enemy from her upbringing. It clearly says that she was a Canaanite. She was a Gentile. She was non-Jewish. And she lived in the area of Tyre and Sidon, Sidon, and that doesn't mean a lot to us today, but when you actually look at history, it meant a lot because there was an area outside of Israel where some of the greatest enemies of the Jews lived. And so Tyre was 25 miles north of Galilee and Sidon was another 25 miles beyond that. So when you think about it, she just didn't get in a car, she just didn't jump on a plane, she just didn't get in a bus, she walked all that way to get there to exercise her faith. So we have Jesus here. His ministry is building. Great miracles are happening. People are following him. You know that he went from small crowds to now he just fed 5,000. And literally that means 5,000 men. That isn't counting women and children. So he just fed everybody off this small amount. Everything's going. And suddenly he leaves the country. He goes out of Israel to an area that's 50 miles away. Why? He did that because he had an appointment with a Canaanite woman. He did that because he clearly tells us he only do, do, did what he heard the father tell him to do. He only said what he heard the father tell him to say. And not just any Canaanite woman, but a Canaanite woman that had a demon-possessed daughter. You got to figure is, uh, especially when you've been to other countries and the demonic realm is definitely more bold and more out front. It isn't that it's not here. It's just not as flashy. But you have a mother here who probably raised her daughter in a house that's full of idols, worshiping and inviting in all kinds of crazy things. And then the next thing you know, the daughter is demon-possessed. In that area, they probably, this family probably worship the goddess Ashereth, which is a goddess that was very common in that area. It was a goddess of fertility. As they've excavated there, that's what almost all of the, the temples and stuff were for. They probably worshipped other pagan de deities at the time. In the midst of all that, she knew that the only thing that could save her daughter from what had happened was the Messiah from the Jewish God. They're arch enemies. Somehow she had heard about Jesus and somehow when she heard about Jesus, it instantly activated that faith within her. She knew instantly, I believe, that he's the only one that could help her daughter at this point in time.
You know, we need to think as parents, the impact we have on our children. The things we allow, the things we don't allow, the things we say, the things we don't say, the things we do, the things we don't do. Children are going to emulate our behavior. And you know the reality is? Sometimes behavior that we can tolerate, they can't. Sometimes the things we can control, it's easy for somebody to say, oh, I'm worshiping this idol and really not think that much about it, you know. People come to church just to come to church because it makes them feel better about themselves. They're really not worshiping God. They're coming to church because it's the right thing to do. But there's people that come to know God and they abandon everything. <laughs> they leave everything behind. You know, when I got saved, I didn't care about anything else. See, her daughter was obviously watching what was going on and now the mother had realized Little ones pick up on alcohol problems. They pick up when parents do questionable things. They pick up when we fight with our spouses. They pick up when we use profanity. They pick up our anger. It's easier to build a child than it is to repair an adult. Huh, Rich? Just on a rabbit trail, we need to start early training our children. It's not the job of the public schools. It's not the job of the Sunday school teacher. It's not the job of the youth pastor. We need to be teaching our children about righteous spiritual things. We need to teach our children right from wrong. But not only do we need to teach them, we need to motivate them to do the right things. See, this mom had trouble. She raised her child in a pagan home. And the reality was, obviously this child took on the fullness. <laughs> this child wasn't just worshiping. This child opened up a door where now had full-on possession. But she heard about Jesus, and she knew that he was the solution. She brought her child all the way to Jesus. She cries out for mercy in verse 22. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And the answer he gives in verse 23 but he answered her not a word. See, it's kind of hard to figure out because he had made this huge trip into enemy territory. He made this great journey. Obviously, when we read the story, it was to meet with this Canaanite woman. And then she actually shows up just like God the Father had told him. She actually shows up with the exact problem that I already believe he knew beforehand. She was going to come. She asked him for help. And reading the passage, he acts like she's not even there. He acts like she's non-existent. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever gone into a store and asked for help and people act like you're not there? Or you're at the restaurant and you need more water or you need silverware and you're like over here you know what when you look at it and you read the passage he was just ignoring her it looks like he didn't care at all but when you read the whole thing in context that's not the case 
See, Jesus already knew the faith of this woman. Jesus already knew what her faith was already going to do without him saying a word. He knew that she had already came out of her comfort zone. She had already went to the enemy. She had already went to the enemy of her gods, the enemy of her people. And she knew that he was the only one that could help. And he also knew that she had the tenacity to stay with it because it's the only thing she had going for her. I really believe when you read the story right before that we went over last week, he was doing it so he could provide an example for Peter, Mr. Little Faith, to show him what real faith was. That even when she was looking at the circumstances, she didn't sink in the water. Why? Because she just came right in. And she wasn't going to go until she got what she wanted. She wasn't looking at, this is the enemy. She wasn't looking at the disciples saying, send her away. She wasn't looking at all the obstacles it took to get where she was getting. She had one focus in mind. She was looking at Jesus. It's almost like he's screaming, Peter, are you paying attention to what's going on right here? He wasn't answering. I really believe he was looking at his disciples as they were making statements and she was non-relenting. See, this woman wasn't going to be discouraged. She wasn't going to be deterred. She had came there to see her daughter set free. He knew, he knew within him that she was going to rise up to the occasion. He knew that she would not be deterred. He knew that she would not take her eyes off. See, but the disciples misinterpreted what he was doing. When he didn't respond, they immediately wanted to dismiss her. In verse 23, it said, send her away and get this woman out of here. See, they're missing the whole point. You'd almost think by the time they said that, she must have been creating a scene. She was like, I'm not leaving until the master prays for my daughter. I'm not leaving until he touches my daughter and sets her free. We're not going out of this place. It's like the people at the emergency room the other day when they said, hey, you know, you don't really need to be here. We have a lot more people. And there, there was people there saying, we're not leaving until you see us. I don't care if I have to stay here all day. See, Jesus was drawing his disciples out, and he was also drawing her out to show Peter and the other disciples that her faith wasn't going to waver. Her faith wasn't going to be tossed to and fro because of what she saw or what they said. See, maybe this is happening to some of you right now. Maybe you've been praying a lot about a certain, certain situation. Maybe you've been praying a lot about something that's going on. And you haven't heard the answer from heaven. Maybe you've been begging God and it's not happening. I got to tell you is that God is listening. This woman was crying out. Jesus didn't speak a word. But you know he was listening because we can read the rest of the story. He didn't answer as quickly as she would have hoped. Sometimes he doesn't answer as quickly as we would hope. There could be a number of reasons. One can be that there's a spiritual battle raging and we can't see it. And we don't want to know what's going on. We just want what we want when we want it. See, in the supernatural realm, it functions right along the natural realm. And we need to stop and realize that.
In the supernatural realm, when we pray, things happen, and we don't even know what happened on the other side of the wall. We're praying, and God is lining up things. God is removing obstacles. And the reality is, because we can't see it, because we can't experience it, because we're not kept informed, that we think all of a sudden God isn't doing something. In the book of Daniel, there's a fascinating story in chapter 10, where you find the prophets praying, and an angel arrives and tells Daniel what's been going on behind the scenes the whole time. See, Daniel had been praying... And nothing was happening that he could see, that he could put his finger on. The angel basically says, hey, Daniel, we know that you were praying and you asked the Lord for help. 21 days ago. We heard what you prayed. We dispatch angels. There's a whole battle going on to carry out this request. Your prayer was heard and it was answered. You just haven't seen the end result yet because there's a lot of obstacles to bringing it to pass. It was stopped by high-ranking demons that overpowered those that were first sent that stopped them from bringing it to pass. So Michael the archangel had to be dispatched to take care of the situation. We had to call out the big guns, Daniel. You prayed, the answer was sent, the answer got stopped, but it didn't get stopped permanently, it only got slowed down. Do you ever wonder what's going on when you're praying? Or are we more worried about getting the answer right now? You ever wonder about what's going on in the spiritual realm? Or when we pray and it doesn't happen right at the moment we pray, do we just give up? Maybe when we've prayed, the spiritual battle has begun raging. When God delays, it doesn't mean there's a denial. Just think about that. When God delays, it doesn't mean... That our prayer has been denied. Just because it doesn't come as quickly as we would like. Doesn't mean that it's not going to come at all. We need to keep praying. I want to tell you sometimes. And this is over and over in scripture. Sometimes our prayers aren't answered. Because of unconfessed sin in our life. Nothing's going to bring our prayers being answered to a greater halt than unconfessed sin. In Psalm 68, 18, it says, if I had not confessed the sin of my heart, or another version says, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, my Lord would have listened, is what he's saying to David, is what David was saying to God. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, it says, listen, the Lord is not weak and he can't save you. He's not becoming deaf because he can't hear you. Here's your problem. You have sinned and you have been cut off from God. Because of your sin, he has turned away and he will not listen anymore. So you know what? If there's sin in our life and it's undealt with sin, that can stop What's going on? And I don't want people to take this in a highly negative, defeatist way. But the reality is, there's sometimes God is showing us stuff, and we want God to do something, but we're not willing to give up. We're not willing to confess. We're not willing to change the things he wants us to change. And the reality is, we spend more time comparing ourselves to others and the way they're handling such situ oh, their situation is way worse. You know, this person deserves to be in the hospital because of the way they live their life, the way they've treated their body. But this person shouldn't be in the hospital because 
they're holy and healthy, and so, you know, I can get away with more. Because I'm not as bad as. You know what? It doesn't work that way. When God is bringing stuff to the surface, it's time to deal with it. It's time to brush it off. It's time to get rid of it. It's time to move on into the fullness that God has for you. One of the problems is we don't want to call sin, sin anymore. We call it something else. We say, oh, that was just a mistake. Oh, it's just one of my shortcomings. Oh, it's my sickness. <laughs> We're claiming it. I always have that pain. I'm always going to have that pain. So just. You know, it's a popular. Everything is a sickness. Why don't you just call it what it is? You know what? If you're an alcoholic, it's a sin. If you're an overeater, it's a sin. It's not a sickness. It's not a deficiency. The doctor can call it that. But you know what? God has another name for it. And if God is bringing it up to you, then it's time to deal with the situation. And you've got to understand is that God is going to see it through to the other side. He's going to help you walk it out. And just because he's telling you doesn't mean he's telling everybody else. If God is telling you to stop smoking and you say, well, that person at church smokes and look at everything they do. If God's telling you to quit smoking, let God deal with them and you just need to do what God's telling you to do. Maybe smoking is holding... I'm just saying is maybe smoking's holding you back and something else is holding them back and God wants, is dealing with something else with them. And we can be hard-headed. Why don't we just admit that the sin is there, we ask God to forgive us and just turn from it. It's super simple and yet so hard. But I got to tell you that if you're not going to deal with sin, you're never going to have that wide open communication with God where he's going to be answering your prayers. If you tell your kids not to do something over and over and over again, pretty soon don't they have to suffer the consequences of what they've done? If you bail them out every time, they're going to keep doing it. And you know what? God's no different with us. He doesn't want to see us fail, but he also doesn't want to be there. You know, he's not the genie that's always just going to lift us out. If I could have the team come up. Another thing that keeps us from God working in our life, and I'm going to continue this on Wednesday, and so if you're not here on Wednesday, you can watch it online. But it can be when we put an idol in our life. It's when we put something before God. We put something in prominence before God. Ezekiel 14.3 says, Son of man, these leaders have set up idols in their hearts. And they embrace things that lead them into sin. Why should I let them be anything to me? Is there something more important in your life right now than God himself? Is there something that you're putting there? Is, there? is there obstacles that you're saying, this can't be overcome? I can't overcome this disagreement with my spouse. I can't overcome the way my parents raised me. I can't overcome what my father, my mother, my brother. I can't overcome those things. Those are idols in our hearts. 
We're putting something up that's saying, God can't go past this point because I refuse to acknowledge that he can change the situation. God doesn't want us to bow before anything. He doesn't want us to worship before any idols. We need to stop things from becoming idols in our life. Any object, any idea, any philosophy, any habit, any occupation, any sport. When we put those things in front, when we put those things in front of God, then we're diminishing our loyalty to the king of the world. Lord, I just pray right now that you would help us, Lord. Lord, I just pray right now we just give you permission. I just want you to agree with me, each and every one of you watching, each and every one of you in this room. Lord, we just give you permission to come in and speak to our lives. Shine lights on the things that we're using. Shine lights on our unforgiven sin, on our sin that we're continuing in, Lord. Shine light. Lord, come and reveal to us the things that are hindering. Even if it's minor, show the things that are hindering us from being all you called us to be. Things that are holding back our faith from being released in the fullness. Lord, I just break those things off people's lives, Lord. Open their ears right now, Lord, to hear what you're speaking right now from heaven. And Lord, may we just walk in the fullness of what you have for us. should never be anything that should keep you because there is nothing that keeps you from the love of God. Nothing. Romans chapter 8 tells us that it doesn't matter life or death, angels, principalities, powers, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Today I want to invite you to the front God has something for you, and sometimes we want to do it alone, and sometimes we just need help, and uh, sometimes the help is just somebody putting their hand on your shoulder and standing in agreement with you for what God has planned for your life. We are not Joseph sharing our hearts with his brothers. We are brothers and sisters in Christ sharing our hearts with one another. 
And that's why we come together. We come together because we need each other. And we need each other to pray for us and love us and support us and back us and be with us. We are not complete and whole without the fullness of the body of Christ. So again, I just want to invite you to the front. Um, if you need just somebody to pray with you, Father, we just thank you so much for your love, your abiding love, your generous love, your mercy, your faithfulness, your truth, your truth, your truth, your judgments. David says, your judgments are good. They are good. Your judgments are good. Your judgments are good. And your judgments are not to condemn us. Your judgments are to teach us. Because when we're in you, Christ, when we're in you, your judgments are good for us. They shape us and mold us into your image and your likeness. And so we love, we love what you do in our lives. Thank you for molding us and shaping us and loving us, even if it's scraping stuff off of us that might hurt. Amen. In Jesus' name.